Chapter 11 of The Hairy Ones Shall Dance by Manly Wade Wellman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 To Meet That Monster Face to Face. I think that both Susan and I fairly reeled before this news, like actors registering surprise in an old fashioned melodrama. As for Judge Pursuivant, he turned to the table, cut a generous wedge of the meat pie, and set it, all savory and steaming, on a plate for himself. His calm zest for the good food gave us others steadiness again, so that we sat down and even ate a little as he described his day in town. He had found opportunity to talk to Susan in private, confiding in her about me and finally sending her to me. This, as he said, so that we would convince each other of our respective innocences. It was purely an inspiration, for he had no idea, of course, that such conviction would turn out so final. Thereafter, he made shift to enter the Gerd house and talk to Dr. Zoberg. That worthy he found sitting somewhat limply in the parlor, with John Gerd's coffin in the next room. Zoberg, the judge reported, was mystified about the murder, and anxious to bring to justice the townsfolk, there were more than one, it seemed, who had beaten him. Most of all, however, he was concerned about the charges against me. His greatest anxiety is to prove you innocent, Judge Pursuivant informed me. He intends to bring the best lawyer possible for your defense, is willing even to assist in paying the fee. He also swears that character witnesses can be brought to testify that you are the most peaceable and law-abiding man in the country. That's mighty decent of him, I said. According to your reasoning of this morning, his attitude proves him innocent too. What reasoning was that? asked Susan, and I was glad that the judge continued without answering her. I was glad that I had sent Miss Susan on. If your car had remained there, Mr. Wills, Dr. Zoberg might have driven off in it to rally your defenses. Not if I know him, I objected. The whole business, what of the mystery and occult significances, will hold him right on the spot. He's relentlessly curious, and despite his temporary collapse, he's no coward. I agree with that, chimed in Susan. As for my pursuers of the previous night, the judge went on, they had been roaming the snow-covered streets in twos and threes, heavily armed for the most part, and still determined to punish me for killing their neighbor. The council was too frightened or too perplexed to deal with the situation, and the constable was still in bed, with his brother assuming authority, when Judge Pursuivant made his inquiries. The judge went to see the wounded man, who very pluckily determined to rise and take up his duties again. "'I'll arrest the man who plugged me,' O'Brien had promised grimly. Now "'That kid brother of mine can quit playing policeman.' The judge applauded these sentiments and brought him hot food and whiskey, which further braced his spirits. In the evening came the invasion by the younger O'Brien of the Devil's Croft and his resultant death at the claws and teeth of what prowled there. His throat was so torn open and filled with blood that he could not speak, the judge concluded, but he pointed back into the timber and then tried to trace something in the snow with his finger. It looked like a wolf's head, with pointed nose and ears. He died before he finished. "'You saw him come out?' I asked. "'No, I'd gone back to town, but later I saw the body and the sketch in the snow.' He finished his dinner and pushed back his chair. "'Now,' he said heartily, "'it's up to us.' "'Up to us to do what?' I inquired. "'To meet that monster face to face,' he replied. "'There are three of us, and, so far as I can ascertain, but one of the enemy.' Both Susan and I started to speak, but he held up his hand, smiling. I know without being reminded that the odds are still against us, because the one enemy is fierce and blood-drinking, and can change shape and character. Maybe it can project itself to a distance, which makes it all the harder, both for us to face it and for us to get help. I know what you mean by that last, I nodded gloomily. If there were ten thousand friendly constables in the neighborhood, instead of a single hostile one, they wouldn't believe us. Right, agreed Judge Pursuivant. We're like the group of perplexed mortals in Dracula who had only their own wits and weapons against a monster no more forbidding than ours. It is hard to show clearly how his constant offering of parallels and rationalizations comforted us. Only the unknown and unknowable can terrify completely. We three were even cheerful over a bottle of wine that William fetched and poured out in three glasses. Judge Pursuivant gave us a toast. May wolves go hungry! And Susan and I drank it gladly. "'Don't forget what's on our side,' said the judge, putting down his glass. "'I mean the steadfast and courageous heart, of which I preached to Wills last night, 
and which we can summon from within us any time and anywhere. The werewolf, dauntlessly faced, loses its dread, and I think we are the ones to face it. Now we're ready for action. I said that I would welcome any kind of action whatsoever, and Susan touched my arm as if in endorsement of the remark. Judge Pursuivant's spectacles glittered in approval. You two will go into the devil's croft, he announced. I'm going back to town once more. Into the devil's croft? We almost shouted, both in the same shocked breath. Of course! Didn't we just get through with the agreement all around that the lycanthrope can and must be met face to face? Offense is the best defense, as perhaps 100,000 athletic trainers have reiterated. I've already faced the creature once, I reminded him. As for appearing dauntless, I doubt my own powers of deceit. You shall have a weapon, he said, a fire that gives light, and we know that such things must have darkness, such as it finds in the midst of that swampy wood. So fill your pockets with matches, both of you. How about a gun? I asked, but he shook his head. No, we don't want the werewolf killed. That would leave the whole business in mystery, and yourself probably charged with another murder. He'd return to his human shape, you know, the moment he was hurt even slightly. Susan spoke very calmly. I'm ready to go into the croft, Judge Pursuivant. He clapped his hands loudly as if applauding in a theater. Bravo, my dear, bravo! I see Mr. Will sets his jaw. That means he's ready to go with you. Very well, let us be off. He called to William, who at his orders brought three lanterns, sturdy old-fashioned affairs protected by strong wire nettings, and filled them with oil. We each took one and set out. It had turned clear and frosty once more, and the moon shone too brightly for my comfort, at least. However, as we approached the grove, we saw no sentinels. They could hardly be blamed for deserting after the fate of the younger O'Brien. We gained the shadow of the outer cedars unchallenged. Here Judge Pursuivant called a halt, producing a match from his overcoat pocket, and lighted our lanterns all around. I remember that we struck a fresh light for Susan's lantern. We agreed that, silly as the three-on-a-match superstition might be, this was no time or place to tempt Providence. "'Come on,' said Judge Pursuivant then, and led the way into the darkest part of the immense thicket. End of chapter 11